Good morning, everybody. Let's see. A beautiful day once again. All right, round three. What was that one quote Rocky says? Let's go. One more round. Starting up with a lovely 777 200. Here's something a little interesting for you. You see that? 7 a.m. We call that a nose number. Now, most people will follow tail numbers. The tail number is the FAA registration, the registration of the aircraft. The nose number is for us maintenance. This is how we keep track of the aircraft. You see over years of purchasing aircraft, let's say from other airlines or different places, sometimes tail numbers become very convoluted, kind of gets hard to keep track of the aircraft. So this is an easier way to track the aircraft just for maintenance purposes. That's all. 7 a.m.? That's close enough. You're on time. <laughs> this was not going international. This one's going domestic, so. Do a quick little walk around, check the logbook. Should be good to go. As we do our usual early morning wake up checks, making sure the aircraft is good to go, do our walk around, it's always nice to admire the ramp. But as pretty as the ramp is, it is actually a very dangerous place to work. You gotta keep your head on a swivel here. There's a million things moving around. Everything from aircraft, baggage tugs, tow vehicles, ground support equipment, you name it, they got it. And people, obviously. So if you are working on the ramp, please make sure you are paying attention to everything. Especially stay away from the running engines. The lovely Rolls-Royce Trent 800 engine. This thing is bulletproof, man. This thing is so awesome. One of the most reliable engines. Look at those gorgeous blades. Oh, here's a cool one for you. So check out uh, on uh, inlet cowling. So you see this? Got a little hole right there. You also got another little hole right there. They usually call those type uh, NACA scoops. So these engines are ran by computers, obviously. The EEC, the electronic engine computer. It's underneath the fan cowl. It's in a encased box. There you go, the big black box right there on the top. This is the engine on the ground with the fan cowlings off. Now those computers also get hot. So the way they design this to cool those computers down is that that little hole will take in air from the intake, circulate it around in that little casing where the computer is, and the hot air comes right back out over here and goes through the bypass. Pretty cool, huh? Looking good, looking good. This is way too bright. Let's change the color scheme. Uh, let's see what we got here. Boarding, safety video, wake up, low immediate breast cancer awareness. Salute to the troops. Let's do salute to the troops. Let's go. There you go. Please select zones. Oh, all cabin zones. All cabin zones. So this is obviously the lighting control panel, but there's also a variety of features on this. We as maintenance can also access certain portions of this system and do basically software uploads or downloads and do operational checks on the whole system. And yeah, I like to play with the lights sometimes. It's always a kind of a nice surprise when the cabin crew walks in and all of a sudden the lights are pretty in different colors. I don't know, gives them a smile. Start. And I'll start a little countdown here, I believe. There you go, almost there. Let's go look at it. Yeah, I like it, I'm digging it. Beautiful red, white, and blue. Did you notice something different about the seat configuration on this airplane? If you rewind and look closer, you'll see that there's seats facing forward and there's seats facing backwards. This is an older generation of the aircraft, so the seating is still outdated, basically. The newer versions all have forward-facing seats. But it's always kind of fun to see this kind of configuration. Imagine landing and you're facing backwards. Yeah, pretty cool. Yeah, it's pretty nice. They even got the ceiling matching. The entryway ceiling. Very nice. So I've showed you guys uh, the, the flight attendant's uh, rest area on uh, Dash 300, which is all the way in the back and upstairs, right? Showed you guys that. But on, on the 200, it's not in the back. 
it's actually right over here closer to the mid galley and uh, <laughs> yeah it's uh, not that big it's uh, no bigger than a broom closet or a walk-in closet it only uh, houses or sleeps four four bunks and uh, it's not very wide like I am NOT a big person I'm actually a very small person and I, I can't even stand in between these two and my shoulders won't fit definitely not the job for you if you're claustrophobic personally me tight spaces don't bother me like I used to do fuel tank diving as well <laughs> talk about tight spaces crawling through baffles is not an easy thing to do anyway moving on yeah it's the, this is not a small it's a small area <laughs> but they still get all the emergency equipment and amenities you know smoke detectors and all sorts of other fun stuff but yeah not very big yeah, don't worry, the pilots don't have it any better either. This is their broom closet. It's actually even smaller. Two bunks. And it's... This is... Yeah. <laughs> I feel bad for, uh, for these guys. This is, uh, this is tiny. So on long-haul flights, if you guys didn't know, pilots take shifts. Two will fly, two will sleep. Just like any other job. And let's say if the flight crew is a little bit larger, let's say it's a flight crew of about five, usually they'll reserve a first-class seat for one of the pilots. But yeah. It's still a small bunk though. The Dash 300 has a much bigger and nicer space. Okay. On to the star of the show. Next office. You see that line on the ground? White, red, and white? That's the threshold line. When the aircraft is active and running or taxiing up, we all stay behind that line. Remember what I told you, don't be around running engines unless you know where to be, which is usually on the sides of the engine. We do this because we do have to leak check these engines time to time. But in general, when you see me walking up, yeah, I'm, I'm zooming in with the camera. I'm not getting anywhere near that engine. Stay away from the expensive blender. It will eat you up. Those things do not discriminate. And for everybody's curiosity, that's what the swirl is there for. On a spinner, it lets us know the engine is running. Remember I told you how loud it is on the airport? Sometimes you won't even hear a running engine. So that's a visual cue. And also the fact that the aircraft is moving and the beacon is gone. I love that sound. Alrighty. You know, somebody mentioned this in the last video and they said, Stig, you're going from Airbus to Boeing, Boeing to Airbus. Yeah, it gets pretty uh, convoluted time to time. I'm type rated on all these aircraft that you see. Running from one manufacturer to the other, you have to reorganize your mindset, your way of thinking. These are all different systems. They work differently. The interface is different. Troubleshooting tactics are different. So when I step on an Airbus 321, let's say, and then I have to go run to a 737, and then all of a sudden run to a 787, every single time you have to get into that mindset of like, okay, this is a different aircraft. I have to approach it differently. Not only that, you have to keep up on the aircraft information as well. You know what the airplane is capable of and what it's not capable of. Challenging? Yes, absolutely. Satisfying? Also yes, absolutely. Moving on. This one is good to go. Clean airplane. Clean airplane. Nothing in the book. Oils are good. Hydraulics are good. Let's see now. Well, you know, I think I've mentioned this before. It's pretty cool. So, the MCU can actually have the capability to give you... Um, live raw data okay stay with me here i'm going to go into a lot of technical mumbo jumbo but i'll describe it the unit i'm pointing at is called the mcdu multifunction control and display unit mechanics and pilots use this pilots will use it to input their flight information such as flight path speeds altitudes performance settings things like that now maintenance on the other hand has a different set of menus in there that's the cfds option you see right there centralized fault display system this is how we can get into the inner workings of the systems and do byte checks. Byte stands for built-in test equipment. It's subdivided with ATA chapters. I think this is turning into a GenFem class. <laughs> anyway, moving on. What is AIDS? No, it's not the virus. This stands for Aircraft Integrated Data Systems. This system collects the parameters of the aircraft and displays it with digital format which you will see me accessing in a moment here. And just a quick short note, FMGC stands for Flight Management Guidance Computer. And the one on the bottom that says ATSU Air Traffic Service Unit. Okay, I'll let you guys look those up and what they do. Come on. You go through AIDS right here, and you go to, oh, it automatically went there, but here. Let's start over here. 
go to aids, and then you go to parameter alpha polyps. So alpha polyps are pretty cool. There is a help menu right here. It gives you acronyms on all the systems, and I'm talking about every single system on the airplane. So for example, uh, let's say we want to take a look at the actual engine AGTs and what's going on with them, the, the live temperature. Okay, a little bit more technical stuff. What I'm trying to pull up is EGT, exhaust gas temperatures. I want to see the values and how hot the engine is. So I can do that through here. And what I'm saying about the EEC, which is the electronic engine control, I should have said FADAC, that, that's the correct term. But I need to energize that system so it can output that information. First, we gotta energize the EECs. Okay, so in order to get the raw data, we gotta energize the EECs, or the FADACs, I should say, excuse me. There you go, energize those. Now they get power going to them so we can get the live data. And let's say I want to look at EGT, exhaust gas temperature of the actual engine right now. Type in EGT, that's the proper acronym. Press that and watch this. Bam! These are the actual values that are happening. Notice they're live, they're changing constantly because the engine just shut down and it's cooling down. Pretty cool. Obviously, there's not only one EGT, there's multiple EGT probes, so you can actually pull back, pull out every single one of them. So if I type in EGT1, I think there's like eight of them or something like that. See? You'll get the, the probe number one data. Cool. Let's say I wanted to know uh, what degrees and what position my ailerons are in. I type in AIL. I can even distinguish distinguish between left aileron or right aileron, but this will give me both. As you can see, these airplanes are very, very smart, and they're also very user friendly. It might look intimidating at first, but after you do this over and over again, it just becomes something that's just natural. It's easy to do. This goes back to me saying earlier, it helps us troubleshoot. The aircraft actually does help us troubleshooting. Some airplanes are so smart, they will pinpoint exactly what's wrong with it. And other aircraft, you have to kind of dig through the manuals and understand the parameters and what it can and cannot do. But overall, I just wanted to give you an example of how smart these airplanes are. Yeah, that's it. There you go. Anyway, pretty cool. And let's get out of here. Go back. Clear all. Don't need that. And power down the EECs. We don't need these on. Okay, on to the next Airbus. Let's see. Everything's actually pretty good on this one, except the FO said his overhead escape rope panel was sticking out a bit. Just asked me to take a look at it. Yeah, it is sticking out a bit. But this was kind of comical. It was pretty funny. Darn thing just popped right out of my hand. So if you didn't know, flight decks all have escape, a way of escaping. Some have ropes like this, like the 320 family, and so is the 737. And they have sliding windows that the pilots can pop open and escape, obviously. This is only in case the flight deck door is obstructed or damaged, basically their way of escaping. Larger aircraft such as the 777, 787, 747, the wide bodies, basically, those things have controlled descent devices. It's basically like a little handle. You grab onto it and then you just kind of you get out of the exit hatch or the window and it slows and slowly brings you down. <laughs> well, that's why, because the rope was stuck in there. It's all right. Let me see. Well, you know, since, since it is out here, let's actually, you guys ever seen the rope, what it looks like here? Oh, it's actually, you know what? It's not really folded up properly. I'll do that. But until we do that, that's what it looks like. So in case of emergency, pilots crack that window open and throw the rope out and egress pretty sturdy hope you know how to climb i think this reach reaches all the way down to the floor i'm not sure now i'm not sure if they still train pilots to do this but i do remember in the past that they did make pilots on, on a simulated aircraft obviously to try to climb up and down the rope but i'm not quite sure but i don't think they do that anymore pilots in the community chime in go ahead let me know what they train you on Oh, and the rope is attached to the frame of the aircraft, so it's pretty sturdy. But anyway, I'm not going to test it. Let's wrap this up and put it back. There you go. There you go. See? Kind of have to, like, layer it like this, so when they pull, it'll just kind of, like, pop, 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 pop. Comes right out. Easy. Not a big deal. 
but there, nice and tucked away. And we'll just put the, the cover back on. And this thing's got a little handle right here, so that's how they hold it and pull out it. So you just held on by two little clips, or three, excuse me. Done, easy. All right, on to the next one. So in between flights, uh, there's a lot of downtime. I'm not constantly running around like a maniac. There are times where it just you have a big gap in between your flights. I try to keep myself entertained. Either help out other co-workers if they have problems or issues. Sit down, read manuals, try to educate myself more. And sometimes you just gotta stop and just enjoy the beauty of aviation. Watching airplanes take off and land. And I know there's a huge uh, aircraft spotting community and you know it's beautiful to watch these things go up and down. And I enjoy that myself as well. But for me, it's, it's a little bit different. My brain goes into a different way of thinking about it. I know what that airplane is doing. I know what those elevators are doing. I know what that landing gear is doing. I know what that engine parameters are going through. All of this information is constantly being dissected in my head and thought through. This is why I find this amazing. This is why I find it so incredible that a big piece of metal like that can just lift off the ground. And the components and the engineering behind it, it's beautiful. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, last flight of the day, lovely plastic princess. People always keep asking me why I call the 787 the plastic princess. Well, the darn thing is pretty much 80% composite by volume. To break it down even further, it actually goes into 50% composite, 20% aluminum, 15% uh, titanium, 10% steel, and 5% other. The other is mechanic tears. <laughs> I'm just joking. Oh, speaking of titanium, as we're gonna walk up to this uh, back end of this uh, GENX, you're gonna see that tail cone or the exhaust cone, and you're gonna see that pretty, pretty blue color. This is actually one of the new 787s we got. That cone is made out of titanium materials. So when titanium is brand new, that's what it looks like. Over time, with heat, the titanium is gonna discolor and it's gonna turn into a very rusty gold looking color. This one actually stays here overnight. And all we gotta do is just give it a little bit of oil. Take the log book, make sure everything's all right. And they're probably gonna take it down to the hangar. But we still do a nice little walk around, make sure everything's cool. All right, there's my oil truck. Let's give it some oil. All right. Yep, it's got electric seats. So does the 777, so does the Airbus. The only one that got the short end of the stick is the 737, still manual. But in case the electrics do go down, there are manual levers at the bottom of the seat that they can maneuver it, so don't worry. Let's put this back. I already saw the guys from the hangar coming up. They're already doing their walk around. They want to get ahead of their work. But for me, it's the end of my day. I hope all of you had a good time, learned some new stuff and had some fun. I'll see you guys on the next adventure. Time for me to go get some rest. As I said, hope you guys all had fun, learned something, and uh, that's it. That was the end of the work week. This is part three of three, and that is all. I'll try to come out with more of these later on. And in between the Stig Shift videos, I'll do also educational videos. Thank you all for all the love and support. Later.